It is my great honor to introduce to you Zainab Salbi, and once you meet her, you will never forget her, and you'll see what I mean after tonight. After we collaborated on a training for Iraqi women in 2003, I have closely watched her professional life, either through her work with Women for Women International, her many Oprah appearances, which I'm sure you've seen, or her other media interviews and events. And I'm continually amazed by Zainab's courage, her creativity, and her determination to change the world, and most especially to change the world of women and how the world views women, not merely as victims of violence and conflict, but as essential agents of change, both in their, in their homes, in their communities, and in their countries. Zainab's book, Between Two Worlds, she shares with us her struggles and her triumphs under life under Saddam Hussein's shadow. But it's not only her story, but that of women worldwide trying to find their voices and gaining the courage to use those voices to make change. I strongly encourage you to get to know Zainab Salbi and her work better by her book. The holidays are coming up. Um, please give a warm welcome to Zainab Salbi. Thank you all for coming here and for the wonderful introduction. Um, you know what, I'm going to start by reading a paragraph. Every instinct in me, survival, loyalty, anger, horror, resentment, guilt, and most of all fear, conspires to prevent me from speaking Saddam Hussein's name out loud. The fact that I use his name now, acknowledge a personal connection to him at all, is for me a watershed no matter how trivial that might seem. He wasn't related to me or my family by blood, but some of my childhood and virtually all of my teenage weekends were merged with his nonetheless. I was taught to call him Ammo and treat him and treated him like a niece. And he treated me like a niece. Though it disturbs me, I can still reach back and conjure up a few fond memories of him. I would convict him of crimes against humanity without a second thought, but not because he singled me out for unkindness. Um, I never had the courage to talk to anybody about that before. It was my deepest and hardest secret. Um, I, was, I was embarrassed of it, uh, but most of all, it, I was so afraid that it will delete who I am today that I was so afraid if I tell anybody that I knew Saddam Hussein, that I called him uncle, um, that I saw him in different weekends in my life, that his face would actually take over mine, that all what people would see is his and mine was disintegrate and, and my identity and my accomplishments and who I am and what I think and my feelings would all be gone away. And I had no intention to telling anybody. I only told my husband for 12 years. And there are a few people, very special people here that and, uh, helped me in the process of telling. Um, there is David Baum here who has been my mentor, um, who helped me, who helped create a safe place for me to, to even expose the story to anybody. There's Robin Lowenthal here, one of uh, my very, very close friends, um, who also I end up telling the story later. But there is one person who taught me um, in a very humbling way that I didn't expect to learn anything from her. It's actually, um, her name is Nabitu. Uh, Nabitu um, is a Congolese woman. She's 55 years old. I met her about a, two years ago, as I was, actually a year and a half ago, as I was starting to work on the book, whether this book should be on women in Iraq in general, or do what um, you know, uh, my agent and uh, co-author tried to um, talk with me about doing it only on my life. And I interviewed Nabitu, as I do with Women for Women. I interview women, survivors of wars, I encourage them to talk, I encourage them to break their silence, and only by breaking our silence can we actually change our, the injustice that we face and all of that. So I'm sitting in front of Nabitu and she's telling me her story. And her story is this is a woman who was gang raped by the rebel forces. 
um, they had they forced her sons to spread her arms and her legs open as they were raping her. They cut her across her body. They broke her arm. Her nine-year-old daughter was getting gang raped by so many men. Nabitu did not know how many. Um, horrible, horrible, horrible story. And I've heard many stories like that before. I never realized um, how courageous these women were for telling me their stories, for telling anybody their stories. And so I, at the end of the, the, my interview of her, she's like, I've never told anybody but you this story. This is my biggest secret. I've never told it to anybody. And, and now I'm questioning a lot of the issues in myself. Do I write my own story? Do I expose it? And, and I usually would, you know, tell Nabita, do you mind if I quote you? And she would say no. And, and, and I would write the story. So this time I stopped and I was like, what should I do with your story? Should I stop or should I, should I keep your secret or should I just talk? Um, and that's what I do is I will tell the world. Or do you want me to keep the secret? She looks at me and she says, and this is a woman whose slippers she made out of garbage, whose dress she had literally been given away by someone who, that's the only dress that she had. She looks at me and she said, if, if I can tell the whole world about my story, and that would stop them from having other women face such crimes. I would. But I can't. You can. You go ahead and tell the world, just not the neighbors. <laughs> My proudest moment was when Nabitu was on the Oprah Winfrey show telling the whole world about her story. My most humbling moment was sitting in front of Nabitu in that moment. I realized I had been someone who talked about courage, but I had not been courageous myself. And there was a difference. Um, I had been someone who would go to Afghanistan and Bosnia and Rwanda and just very passionate about women's issues in war, but never been able to de address my own demons and my own fear myself. Um, and Nabitu, the illiterate woman, from a small village in Congo with a broken hand and horrible, horrible atrocities that I'm supposed to help in the program that I started with Women for Women International taught me the biggest lesson of my life. It takes courage to talk and it's not easy. Um, so I write the story. So uh, he, this is, this is, you know, um, I, I, I tell it and it's, it's, it's my nightmare and it's, it's my fear to talk about that, but here it is. Um, Saddam was um, someone I grew up with. My father was his personal pilot. Um, and I always say being close to the devil only makes you that much closer to danger. It doesn't protect you. It was impossible saying no to him. Um, you, to say no, to reject his offer for my father to be his pilot would be uh, to be killed or imprisoned or having all your assets possessed or um, anything like that. My parents kept on thinking that they can manage the relationship as they later told me. Um, but instead, um, they, they eventually he became like a leaked gas as I think of him in our house and we breathed him slowly until we each, we each tried to resist in our own ways and we each surrendered in our own ways and we each survived in our own ways. Um, and I resisted in, in different ways actually. I, I, I grew up knowing that this is a man to be feared. I grew up hearing my mother's friends whispering with each other and crying in the middle of our garden. I grew up hearing my aunt, who was very much against him, would tell me about what he had done to women, how he had a People's Day, for example. And in his People's Day, he, uh, it's a day where other people can come to him and, cons and ask him for his help uh, to solve their personal problems. He would wear a doctor's jacket um, to solve people's problems. And when he liked a woman, in, in one of the visitors who are seeking for his help, he actually many, many times would take them to the other room and rape them. There are times in which they were um, mobile 
people day, people's days in which he would go to other um, villages and would do the same thing. Women one by one would come to his van and he would consult with her and if he liked her, he would rape her. Um, they were, um, he talked to my own family, how he killed his best friends, how he killed his lovers, how he killed his colleagues. Um, I dated a guy as one of my escape mechanism, who I thought he was an opposition, and through him I learned that he would, that the Ba'athist party would rape women and, rep and videotape their rape as a mechanism, as a way to uh, blackmail them. Um, if you don't join the Ba'ath party, if you don't, not the Ba'ath party, if you don't join the Mukhabarat, the secret service, and spy on your family members, we'll show that video rape and we'll expose you. Um, rape was used to torture uh, male opposition political figures. And so there are a lot of Muqtada Sadr, the very f famous or infamous uh, religious opposition in Iraq. Um, his aunt was gang raped by the Mukhabarat in front of her brother and, and was only released when she was in late stages of her pregnancy. Um, so I, the more I knew about that, the more... Um, you, you try to resist it different ways. So I resisted through dating a guy who I thought that he will take me out of that relationship, that he will, he was, the, he would be the man in a white horse and uh, will help me escape. And to my disappointment, he, I realized I only um, wanted to get closer to Saddam. Um, my resistance, the day I surrendered, was a day I wore a yellow dress. It's pathetic. But my resistance was not to wear bright dresses as his daughters and his wife and his family, female family members did. I resisted by wearing only black and white dresses and not putting makeup on. That was just my small resistance. We each resisted in small ways. You know, at the end of the day, you resist, um, you know, you think, and here it's, it's easier to talk about black and white dynamics. Why didn't people rebel and kill him? Why didn't your family leave? Uh, when you're in this situation, you resist about the small things. You resist, my father resisted on how to keep his most basic, basic ethics together. My mother resisted by how to protect me and my brothers. Um, I resisted by not wearing the dresses that they wanted me to wear. And the day I resisted and the day I surrendered is war. A yellow dress, a big tufta dress in the 80s. I don't know if yeah, I'm sure many of you remember the 80s, you know, the big um, the dresses. Um, so we resist in different ways and we surrender in different ways. And that has been um, the, the, my life stories, how actually we, we try to survive, we keep intact the small things, and how a lot of the answers are also in the small things, not in the big things. Long story short, I come, my mom arranged a marriage for me in America. I don't understand why did she do that. How could, you know, she begs me to accept the marriage. I have to clarify, arranged marriage does not mean forced marriage. Arranged marriage means the family putting, you know, introducing the man and the boy and, you know, sometimes putting a lot of pressure on the, each side to get married, sometimes not. I had the choice to say no. But, but when I wanted to say no, my mother cried and was like, I can't take you back to Iraq. I will not take you back to Iraq. Um, so I accepted. And so it's funny because I resist, I, 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 I was so angry at my mother for the longest time. How could she, how could she do the very things that she told me not to do? I grew up with a mother who told me not to let anybody touch me, abuse me, yell at me. Um, I grew up with a mother who told me that I have to be strong and independent and never to cry. And I have to marry for love and all of these things. And here she is arranging a marriage to me with a stranger who is 13 years older than me. And I didn't understand that. And I left him when he did the very same thing she wanted me to escape from. Uh, when he violated me in the very same way she was so worried that I would be violated in Iraq. Because anybody, any woman was vulnerable to Saddam or his, bro or his brothers or his son's um, uh, lust and, and, and violence. And I didn't know why she did that. But I do know that when the day I left that husband, um, I decided to create a new identity. 
I decided that I'm never gonna tell anybody about my past, that I am to start a new. I had no money whatsoever. I had $400 in my pocket. Saddam had invaded Kuwait at the time. I had no way to get back to Iraq or to actually even reach my parents to tell them I loved him. And I determined, I was determined that day that I am to create a new identity for who I am. So I go, I meet a wonderful man a couple of years later who is, who has been and still is my husband who saves me from myself many, many times. Um, I sat Women for Women International after I read about the rape camps in Bosnia. And I didn't know what I was doing as I was taking myself through my work over and over again to the exact same context that my mother took me out of, war and women violations, rape and all of that. And I would go to Bosnia and I would go to Croatia and I would go to Rwanda and Congo and Kosovo and Afghanistan. I was like, I wanted to know what women go through in war. And I learned many stories. And I saw myself in each story, but I was so afraid of telling them. I remember the Bosnian woman who was writing through her, uh, to her sponsored uh, women. We have a sponsorship program that links women all over the, the United States and 33 other countries with women survivors of war. And each sponsor sent her mass sister $27 a month along with a letter to start communication link between the two women. I read, I remember reading a Bosnian woman who was writing saying, I am losing the eye in me. And my mother, I grew up with my mother saying, I'm losing the eye in me. I feel like a bird stuck in a cage and can't fly. So I would go to over and over and over to these same contexts and I would ask women, talk, don't be afraid. And in many ways, I came to realize that, the, that women, particularly at the grassroots level, particularly the ones from the most excluded and marginalized neighborhoods, were actually the most courageous women. They had nothing to lose. They were the ones who talked. Not the middle class, not the upper middle class. It was women at the very grassroots level who were talking. And because of them, we changed. We were able to change laws and policies vis-a-vis -vis women and war. We were able, for the first time in our history, to prosecute rape as a war crime through the Rwanda War Crimes Tribunal and the Yugoslavia War Crimes Tribunal. So it was these women who were talking, but I was too afraid to talk. I was too afraid to even utter Saddam Hussein's name. And I was too afraid to even tell my family what I did for a living, or what I do passionately to live. Because I was afraid if he saw that I'm helping with the Bosnians and he, and he was supportive of, the, of Milosevic, that would seen as something against him and that he would punish my parents. We were so afraid. And so I didn't know my story until my mother uh, was on, almost on her deathbed. She had Lou Gehrig's disease. She came to America to, to be treated. And it was when we knew that she was dying that I asked her to tell me the story. And it was then that I realized that my mother was no different than the Vietnamese mothers who threw their babies at American soldiers no different than the so many mothers that I've met in Afghanistan and Congo and Rwanda who would just give me their daughters and say, here, take them. You'll get, you'll, maybe you'll give them a better life. That my mother was trying to save me. And that mothers in many ways were the real heroines of war. And so she gets me in marriage because she was afraid that Saddam may be liking me and that she was afraid that she can't protect me. It's interesting because I was so angry. I got married to such an abusive guy. I was so angry at my mother for displacing me and dispossessing me and to leaving me alone without a family member. And yet I'm so grateful for these moments because if it wasn't for these moments, I wouldn't be who I am today. And I wouldn't be you know, developing my views and my identity and all of that um, the way it is today. And I learned through my mother's death, which in many ways was the best gift she has given me, ironically, is her death. But I got the truth with that. And I got and I learned so much from her in the way she handled her death. So I learned that my misfortune actually have led to my fortunes. And that these challenging moments that I hated so much, I was so angry at everyone, including God, 
for doing this to me. And I learned that these were the moments in which it made me who I am. And, and to be the person that I'm so grateful for everything around me, for the things I have and what I don't have. Um, the day Saddam's left, uh, or, or regime was overthrown, was the happiest day in my life. Um, and I went back to Iraq. And I went back to the house my mother grew up in. And, and I went to the same room where when I was 11 years old, she told me that how Saddam had deported 200,000 Shias between 1980 and 82. And she told me what her ethnic origins were and about the, the ties that she had with Saddam. It was the same room where she told me her life as a child. That room, we now replicate Women for Women International's work. It's a safe haven room. Because part of what we do, not only sponsorship program, that we link women between uh, the two worlds, um, but we also, the women who are getting into the program, we immediately start meeting with them in these safe havens in the countries that we work in. And through these safe havens, we start talking about women's role in the society, in economy, in politics, in health, in all of these things, through storytellings through simple storytellings about how women address certain challenges in their lives and how they have overcome these challenges. And we also give them vocational skills training and business training, and at the end of the year, we actually teach them, uh, help them start small businesses and stand on their feet and, and create dependency, independence. Um, and in these rooms that I got to know that the women that we categorize from the TV screens in here as visible refugees, you know, with the headscarf and the fly and the torn clothes, um, they're tough cookies. If anything, I'm in awe of this woman's carriage. The women that we feel, you know, um, pity for in, in the TV ads uh, that talks about why we should help other people. Um, these women have gone through so much. And if war shows us anything, it's like a flashlight at humanity. At, in my opinion, at the best sides of humanity as well as the worst sides of humanity. And these women have that, that strength that keeps them going. Whether it is Nabitu who still was laughing as she was talking with me, or whether it's Beatrice, a woman from Rwanda, who seven of her children died on top of her in a church massacre, and she survived because their bodies covered hers. And she adopted five children since then, and she um, was smiling as she is sitting in front of me saying, thank you for listening to me. And so through these women, I learned to recognize that the answers to how do we build peace and how do we build security and how we build democracy is really not in the big grandiose answers or questions. It's really in the small ways. When you talk to these women about what they want, they talk about water, electricity, food, jobs, shelter. And they're very aware about their rights. They want it. Some of them are aware. Some of them, when they get awareness, they, they pick it up. They want it. There's no confusion about it. But it's, it's how can we go down to the small, look, small answers, that it doesn't have to be the big answers. And when we're missing out on these small answers, that's when we are losing to the very same enemy we are fighting. Fundamentalism, terrorism, all of these things. These guys goes to the, go to these women and offer them very tangible services. They offer them the food and the clothes and the transportation and the schooling for their kids and the money. And unless we are willing to compete on that same level, on, by going to the very, very grassroots and paying attention to what women are saying, not only because we are women, but because women are critical mass in changing directions for the societies. And women, when, if they shift to fundamentalism, that's when, we, that's when we have to be scared. And many are. That I learned through these women, they are setting up the tones that women are indicators, the bellwethers for the direction of the society. Bad things starts with women, good things also starts with women. Violence often, almost often enters through women first. It's soft, it's, it's, easy, it's, it's easy to overlook. 
and we don't pay attention to it and we look over it, you know, we skip it and we just say, oh, it's just women. In many ways, I think we are conditioned to accepting violence against women. It's just violence against women. All societies have this. All these cultures, they are so different. Da, 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 da. We need to shift the way we look at women's issues and violence against women, particularly in war times or post-wars or pre-wars, from just violence against women to an indicator, to a measurement to where the society is going. And similar things in the solutions. Often peace negotiations and discussions and all of that has only men in it. And it's not only men from that other part of the world, it's men from here as well. And unless we get women at the negotiating tables, their right will be negotiated away. And when their rights get negotiated away, the whole society is going away with them. Now, I'm a witness of that in Iraq right now. Um, whether it's through uh, the constitutional process or whether it's through the governing process or whether it's through the solutions process of only talking about the army and the police and not talking about the tangibles that addresses people's life. But we are witnessing now Saddam's trial about to start in two days and women and his crimes against women are not anywhere in it. This is a historical moment for us to document um, our history, not only as Iraqis, but actually as human beings, and as, as, as we are dealing with one of the worst dictators in, in recent history. When we don't document his crimes against women, we are setting up, we're, we're giving them messages, in my opinion, just do it. As so many armies have done it, as so many dictators have done it, and in the case of Iraq, if it was before uh, government-sponsored vertical violence as I see it, now it is societal-sponsored horizontal violence, in which educated working women um, are getting assassinated, um, regular women day and night are we're, we're finding bodies, their bodies on the shores of the Tigris and the Euphrates as they are being killed and more crimes against women happening without it's being noticed. This is a historical moment to document his crimes against women. And we simply cannot move forward. As a society, in the case of Iraq, I think as a women's movement in the case of the larger picture, if we don't document that past. We can't move forward if we don't tell the truth. And we can't seek our reconciliation if we don't look or tell, the, document the truth. Um, and that's what, what I'm trying to... Well, that's what we're trying to work on, uh, and not in Women for Women in terms of all the things, but through this book, trying to urge people to make sure that we have advocacy for a longer uh, trial for Saddam to get legitimacy and to make sure that we have women's crimes as part of his indictment. Um, now, if my life, the day I started in America with the $400 in my pocket leaving an abusive husband had been a testament of anything, and starting Women for Women International, all of that, is that it is actually possible to make a difference. It's actually possible to live our dreams. This was not my country. I had no family here. I had no money here. I had nobody here. If anything, I was what I call an invisible refugee, a person that had lipstick on but had nothing. And we only pay attention to the ones who don't, who look different, but not the ones who look like us. Um, if it has been a testament of anything, that it is possible to make a difference. This group, Women for Women International, has started with nothing. My husband and I had just been married. We had no money whatsoever. We saw the rape camps in Bosnia, and we said, we've got to do something about it. And so, long story short, we put together a group. The Unitarian Church support us. Um, Twelve years later, we've helped 52,000 women. 230,000 family members sent $21 million, um, have nine offices in, in nine countries, uh, work in Iraq, Afghanistan, Kosovo, Bosnia, Rwanda, Congo, Nigeria, in our way to Sudan, featured six times on Oprah, honored by President Clinton, da 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 It goes on and on and on. Never in my wildest dream did I think that what I used to be referred to as the pilot's daughter in Iraq, because that's how it, we were referred to, um, was able to actually start an organization and reach out to other women in other parts of the world. It is possible to live our passion, and it's possible to live our dreams. Um, you know, um, I'm a big fan of Rumi's uh, poem. 
and one of his uh, poems, um, he talks about that out beyond the worlds of wrongdoings and right doings, there is a field. I will meet you there. And I think my life has been in this field, actually. It has been in between the wrongdoings and the right doings. But I humbly add, in this era of war, out beyond the worlds of war and peace, there is a field, and women and some few good, really good men <laughs> are meeting there. Um, and that's what we're trying to do with Women for Women International, by writing these letters and sending the money. The money is one thing. The letters um, is to document our own stories and write part of ourselves and not only write our checks and listen to other women's stories. And unless we know the complexities and the nuances of wars, and unless we know what it, what it means to impact women's lives, we can't, the, we can't reach to discussions of peace and sustainability and development and all of that. Unless we understand the simple story, we can't talk about the big one. So this is the title of my book. Um, but I can't finish today if I don't really acknowledge, again, some of the great friends that I have here, David and Terry, Robin, um, I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for my husband's love and for some very, very good people around me. Um, there is, there may be a lot of evil in this world, but there is actually, I think, more good in it. And as someone who grew up in war and live in war and work in war, I believe that it could be better. So thank you so much uh, for hearing me. For doing questions yeah. and answers. Yeah, like yeah sure. Um. I know this comes off. <laughs> well, I'll talk while I'm doing this. One thing that I should have mentioned earlier is that um, we're actually recording, as everyone probably noticed, and um, we make some of our talks available uh, with the partnership with WGBH um, over the web so that if people couldn't be here tonight, that they'll be able to access what's going on here tonight. So I just want to let people know that, um, that this is being recorded. I'm sure that you'd be happy to talk to folks off the record after the event um, if they have questions. So because we only have one microphone, um, if you do have a question that you'd like to ask or a comment you'd like to make, if you would line up in the middle and I'll shuttle the microphone back and forth between you. Okay? So who wants to get us started? Um, yeah, I, I wanted um, to thank you very much um, from the bottom of my heart for what you shared. And I want you to know that what you're talking about in war is going on right here. It goes on all over the world, but it's also going on right here in the United States. You know, I grew up in a white middle class suburb, rape, murdering of children, murdering of animals, strangling, all this kind of stuff going on right here. So I think that um, if we can come from that place and also work to help everything that's going on in all the other parts of the world, because it's, it's right here. It's right here, too. In every, in every home, in every, in almost, I mean, maybe not every home, but in many, many homes and in many, many families, there's war zones right, right in Massachusetts, right everywhere, everywhere. Thank you. Because when I've learned, what I, one of the things that I learned is by sh showing our vulnerability, a lesson I learned <laughs> uh, from David and other good friends, is what makes us actually better leaders. And I think in many ways, when you leave America and you go and talk to other parts of the world, and as you notice, I refuse to call it the third world. I think they are just two different worlds. They have the good and the bad and the ugly in both worlds. Um, and so there isn't one is better than the other, it's just different. Um, but they think of America as this big, giant, super concrete country. We can't reach it. And, and uh, particularly American women. Wonder women, liberated, free, da da da, everything is perfect, we don't have to. And one of the things that we do actually in our small group sessions, we talk about the issue of domestic violence as one of the examples we, we talk about. And we use examples of American women. And it's, we always see the same reaction. Women sitting back like, huh, it happens in America? 
and we start talking more details about how American women organize and all of these things. And that's when it, it, it changes. That's when they say, well, then if this woman is happening to them, then I'm going to talk also. So it's only by showing our vulnerability do we actually reach out more to the hearts and minds of people. And in many ways, we're just coming out, America, as a big country. And we need to humanize it. And we need to take ownership of our own voices, particularly as women. And that's what we are trying to do. Hi. Um, I was interested. You said you left your abusive relationship. You were out with $400 in your pocket and ended up being able to create this you know, internationally recognized um, organization. I was just curious as the steps that you took from the, the $400 to the you know, the recognition. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> I worked uh, in a Hallmark store at the Limited, at a medical lab, I had lots of low paid jobs. Um, then, you know, you just have to pay attention to the signs. Um, I got a job in Washington, D.C., and this woman who gave me the job was so kind and generous, and it's interesting because she also gave me uh, furniture and kitchen supplies and a plant that I still have it with me, you know, 15 years later now. Um, and I love that plant and would never let anyone. Um, it's, you know, perseverance. <laughs> I know, you just keep on believing. You just, you know, the w starting woman for one was not an easy thing. My husband, I married a guy who didn't have any money either. Um, and there were lots of times in which we didn't know if we are going to make it. And there are lots of times we didn't have uh, rent for the office uh, for next month. And I'm just like, maybe I should give up. And there would be a check. I swear, a check would come that covers three months' rent. And that's when I was like, okay, I'm supposed to do what I'm doing. And so... I think when we do what we are passionate about, a lot of people say, what's the re reason for success or whatever? I think it's being passionate about what you're doing and being true to your beliefs and who you are and just do it. And, and people see that and people join, you know. Um, and so there were three years, gosh, Robin, you were a witness of it, you know, in which we didn't have salaries at all. We didn't have health insurance. We didn't have anything. We didn't have any anything. And every time I, I question myself and say, maybe I should just give up. Maybe I should just go and look for a job. Something happens. And so the turning point was uh, there were many doors, I call them. Sometimes they were checks. Sometimes they were people like some of the people in here. Sometimes um, it was someone who nominated us for working assets after hearing me speak on a radio, and we got a $67,000 check that saved the organization. And now it's an $11 million organization with 200 staff members. So just, just just believe. I just believe and I just keep on noticing the signs and if the things are moving then you're doing the right things. Um, remind me how to say your name. Is it Zainab? Okay. Um, I was so gladdened and touched by your story and a part of it that really struck me was the part where you said that I think you said something like the happiest day of your life was when Saddam Hussein was captured. And hearing your story, I can absolutely understand that. Um, I feel like it's, um, for me, this is a difficult question to ask, but I can't help but ask it. I feel like the United States has a lot of blood on its hands, um, a bad track history. And um, I was against the war going into it because I, I just really you know questioned our motives and so I want to and I'm sure you can you probably have some understanding of the reasons behind that kind of thinking as well and so I'm just curious um, how you how, how you see that situation overall you know being gladdened by his capture and yet the complexity of so many lives that have been lost on account of that you know, I'm going to take this chance to answer another question, actually, because I was on C CNBC, I think, and I was talking about how I cried the day he was captured, that I was happy. It was a happy day. And the, um, and they, the person who was interviewing me couldn't understand why I cried. And today I got a call from a Congolese friend, and she's like, I understand why you cried. I hated Mobutu, and I cried the day he died. 
And it is crying for ourselves, for our own humanity. For me, I was definitely crying for me, not for him. Because I hated him. I really do. Um, but I didn't want to have a joy over someone else's humiliation. Not if it was, not even if it was my own enemy. And I see him as one. Um, in terms of the war, you know, I, I work in wars and I see the consequences of wars and I'm never someone who likes wars. Um, so I hate wars. And having said that, and I don't have a consistent answers as much as I hate wars, I was happy the day he was captured. And it's a, it's a complex, if they're parallel feelings, they don't, they don't make sense together, um, but they do for me. Um, at least that's my honest uh, question. In terms of how to move forward, um, you know, again, we, we, the, the biggest mistake is that there were no plans on the day after. More Iraqis were being prepared for the chaos bro that could be brought by looting than for the war. Um, and, you know, and it was clear. Um, in terms of how we move forward, as someone who focuses on women, I say bring women back. We can't have strong countries if we don't have strong women in it. And Iraqi women were far more, org more excited. They wanted to be part of every single thing in this new government. And they weren't. They had to struggle to even get the representation there. And they're very clear about what, what, what they did. We had a survey at Women for Women International for 1,000 Iraqi women in Basra, Mosul, and Baghdad to try to see what women are saying in wars. 94% of the women we surveyed said they want to protect their legal rights very clearly in the Constitution. 87% of the women we surveyed said that they want to make sure that they, they should have women in both national and local elections and national and local councils and all of these things. When you talk about Iraqi women and, and, their, and, and how we incorporated them in the process, there wasn't much incorporation. There was limited. It's decent, but not very good. Um, so how do we move forward? Go to back to the small answers. Go back to the food and the distribution of electricity and water and all of that. It's 130 degrees. It was 130 degrees in Iraq, in Baghdad in, in June. And there were six hours of no electricity for two hours of electricity. And there were three weeks with no water. And I, can't, I don't care which culture or society it is. When it's that hot and no electricity and no water, you lose your sanity. You know, you just... You fight. <laughs> um, and so how can we ba go back to the small answers? How can we bring, bring women back at the negotiating table? How can we go back and provide these uh, small tangible solutions? That's how we move forward for me. Um, and how can we use Saddam's trial as a historical opportunity to unite the country and create a vision, an, a vision where Iraqis have ownership of it as we move forward in Iraq? I had the honor of working with Iraqi women and seeing their strength. I worked in, in the north of the country with Manal some, and I worked in a town, a city, Kirkuk, which is a city that's divided, it's one-third um, one Kurdish, one-third Turkmen, and one-third Shia, is it Shia? I don't know, one-third other. And um, there was an incredible internal strife and violence, and it was hard to bring people together. We had tried to do conflict management groups, and it was very hard to pull people together. The people that would come together were women. Women came together across these ethnic groups and dealt with issues of women, family, and community um, in a positive and strong, amazing way. Um, and I, in part, learned how to bring them together from your organization. So it's um, really quite incredible. It's really, it's, thank you. It's the power of the grassroots, um, you know, we do that in, we did that in so many countries that we work in and we still do it where we bring women together. And there's all of these big programs about conflict resolutions and all of that and talking to men in leadership and women in leadership positions. And they would, and so many people would come like, what? Do those people expect us to love and, and, and forgive each other after three hours of a seminar. We brought women, and this is not only in Iraq. I mean, I re, 
at the grassroots level because you bring a new, women together and to talk about something else, not dialogue, but their children and their need for economic solutions and, and all of these things. And then you bring the political dialogue as part of it. And I've witnessed it in Iraq, I've witnessed it in Bosnia or Bosnia and Serbian and Croatian women talking with each other and with Rwanda, with Hutu and Tutsi talking with each other in Nigeria, with Muslims and Christians talking over and over and over again. It's amazing how the answers are very simple. But we don't acknowledge women at the grassroots as a critical mass. I don't believe that, you know, um, who are the women who come here? We invite women to come here and then I always say, I don't represent Iraqi women. I'm one of them, but not all of them, nor anyone in here represent all American women, for that matter. So we should not be confusing by bringing the English-speaking people who are the elite who went to schools that taught English, and then we say, this is everyone. We need to pay attention to the, the grassroots, to, to the real, to the ones who are carrying life on a day-to-day -day basis. The solutions in many ways are with them, and we've got to acknowledge their, the importance of their role. Um, I think you actually mentioned, you referenced what my question was going to be in your last answer, but I was just wondering if you could say a little more about the fact that um, in a lot of activism today, in the U.S. anyway, it tends to be more inclusive in terms of um, we're not just working for, that even if we're working for women's rights, we're trying to include men in that struggle as well. And I'm intrigued and I'm kind of, I like that your organization is called Women for Women and you seem to be about making, and you made the comment in your speech about um, you know, women meeting in that field and some select men and um, just your choice to make to to make a movement that uh, seems based on personal connections between women and, and really focusing on that as a driving kind of force rather than trying to work for some more inclusive, I mean you could be alienating people by doing that but at the same time I think you're I think you're really getting at something. I was just wondering about your choice to do do it that way. Be the one who's going on and back about that. Um, yeah, we, you know we do talk with men a lot. Uh, we actually have a program, a formal program, um, formally called leadership training for men, informally called women's rights training for men. <laughs> and we, you know, and we go to men in leadership positions in the countries that we work with, in the communities that we work with. And it's like, listen, if you want to be a good leader, you've got to understand what. 60% of your population is asking for. And, and so, so I do actually, while I do believe that women present that bridges of peace and that we need to take access of our ownership of our resources and our voice, I also believe in the importance of talking to men, particularly actually men are the, we, we know what we, what we want. What Women for Women is doing is connecting women together and making it happen. But we still need to talk with men. It's very important. And we talk about with them at the leadership level of the local communities. But also, I'm, I'm more curious to talking with men in leadership positions in different countries and all of that because we need, I find it fascinating how many men I met in, in the UN and, and, and the big institutions and they, they still don't have women representation there. And when you talk to them, it's like, why? It's like, well, we can't find the women. I just don't understand because, you know, it's, it's we are here and we know what we're doing and we're very clear and we have very good successful track records. Um, so I am interested in talking with men. I just think it's different track than connecting women together and creating that movement to get women together and say, we have a voice and, and creating that critical mass, both not only on that end, but on this end as well. Hello. Um, I saw you on Oprah three years ago, and I sponsored my first woman, especially because of your passion. Um, and I just wanted to mention my first woman, her name was Titsi Huse, and she was 54 years old. She was a widow, and in her society, she was basically living in poverty. She had seven children, six girls, one boy. Uh, none of her children were going to school, and she was unemployed. And during the year that, that I sponsored her, she was able to raise hens and chicks, and she learned how to sell her products in the market, and she was able to send her children to school. And when I would get the letters from her, they were just amazing. And one of the letters that I received from her, I will never forget, she talked about how she would go to the village, and she would work really hard, and she would sell her food stuff, 
and then she would go back into the village, talk with her friends, and dance. And I just thought that's pretty much what the rest of us do. Um, it's just in a different part of the world. And I just was going to ask you if you could just talk a little bit. You talk about how this bring, you bring so many women in war, you give them hope. But there's also a benefit of this organization that you sometimes don't receive, and that's for the individuals that are, are giving. And I, I think that might be something you might want to mention. Say that Karen. This is my first day to meet her, but I've heard about her because um, she called the organization one day and she said, "You know, you are doing the butterfly effect." And I was like, "What's the butterfly effect?" You know, I'm my foe. Um, and I learned that the butterfly is uh, flipping its wings and, and, and it's impacting weather patterns and that if we actually do one woman at a time and we try to create social changes in these small patterns that we can make a difference. Um, so thank you for this um, and thank you for this question actually because let me use my own example. First time I wrote a letter to a woman and um, it's I, I wanted to say I travel to this country and this country and I'm like, mm, can't tell them that, you know, she doesn't, she never left her, her village most likely, or if she is in a refugee camp. Then I wanted to tell her I went to this movie and this movie, I was like, can't tell that either. And then I wanted to tell her I just ordered my, you know, nice orange sofa, I was like, mm, can't tell her that either. <laughs> um, and then finally, I said, just like, well, what can I talk about? And I started talking about my brothers. And, you know, I love my brothers, but I never would think to talk to anybody about them. And it's a very emotional story for me because um, this book is helping us talk about our own past and how each one of us have witnessed different stories and how we are each traumatized by it. But I actually start paying attention to how much I love my brothers and how important they are to me. And it was that simple letter who would have thought that it would get me closer to my brothers? And so I think in many ways it is close, it helps us learn the value of what we have. What, at the end of the day, what is the most important thing? And that's what we write about, is our human relationships. Um, but it also, I think, is a humbling experience. Uh, every time I get um, a letter from my Rwandese sponsored uh, woman, and she's like, keeps on, thank you, thank you, may God bless you for your, you know, for your sacrifice. And it's not a sacrifice. And she keeps on praying for me, sacrifice, sacrifice. And I'm like, it's not a sacrifice, it's $27 a month. Um, it's a humbling experience to think, you know, that the small things that we have can change lives, actually. Um, and what, like what you said, can get people having a better life. Um, so in many ways, I think it's as much of a healing experience for us as it is for the women that we are helping. And for sure, for me, uh, it has been, a, they have been my best teachers. Um, it's a very, it's in that, we need to learn from that humility and we need to learn. And if the letters are trying to do anything politically, it's actually to understand the nuances of wars. What does it mean for a woman in Afghanistan to go and walk for one hour each direction to get water? And why does she think the way she thinks? What does it mean for a woman in Congo um, not to have uh, sh whatever, not even a house because the rebels came? And what does that mean? And where does the arm come from? And who is selling the arms? And you, it changes the dynamics of the war from the big, complex intellectual discussions to the simple stories. And that's how I think we can actually talk about war um, in a more real way. Thank you. I feel I should uh, apologize for my impersonal question, but uh, in listening to National Public Radio, I haven't heard anything about the pros and cons in the new constitution for women's rights. Could you tell us something briefly about that? Sure, actually, I've been doing interviews the whole day about it, so I'll just go in my, you know. <laughs> um, there are some good things and there are some bad things. Um, let me acknowledge the good things in the proposed constitution. There are two major laws that were significant. One is citizenship law. Um, now Iraqi women have the right to pass on their citizenship to their children even if they were married to non-Iraqi men. This is actually, you may think of it as simple, but none of the Arab countries or most Arab countries do not have that law and it's a big deal in an Arab uh, context and that's a big accomplishment because it, for me it um, shows the equality of citizenship and not only talking the talk. 
The other good thing is the quota, at least a guarantee that women will have a 25% representation in the parliament. And initially, the constitutional drafting committee members wanted to change that and make it an electoral law, and women lobbied very hard to keep this. So it's a big accomplishment. On the other hand, this is the good news. Um, the not so good news is it's very ambiguous in terms of issues that relate directly to women. Family law, most particularly, that regulates marriage, inheritance, custody, divorce, etc. Um, and it's so vague. It introduces first the idea of religious courts, which we did not have in Iraq. It, the religion was incorporated as part of the state. So while the state respected religion, it was part of the state's court. It introduces the idea of having religious scholars interpret the law as part of the Supreme Court. And it is very vague in terms of the directions that the country will go. It's, um, there are two kinds of constitution. There are the ones that specify all the details, as in the South African and the Rwandese constitution. And there is the one that is very broad and vague and all of that, and we have the latter in Iraq. So in, a, in an atmosphere of violence against women, right now, where women, where educated working women, professors, pharmacists, reporters, um, uh, you name it, are getting assassinated. I personally know 20 friends and colleagues who have been assassinated in Iraq because of just their outspoken, working, uh, educated women. Where in an atmosphere where women's hair salons are being bombed, in an atmosphere, an atmosphere where female college students are being raped and kidnapped, um, and more violence, random violence against women in the streets, women are very scared about the direction that this constitution may be taking. We don't know yet. It's not, it's neither good or bad. It's just vague. But we're very scared of how, who is going to interpret the law, um, how we're going to be vulnerable to that one person who is going to interp uh, interpret the law, uh, what the direction is. And if uh, at Women for Women, we believe so strongly that we simply cannot build strong countries if we don't have strong women in it. Um, uh, women's issues is definitely not in the... Um, and the higher priorities for the discussions that are going right now. And unless we manage to switch that paradigm of thinking in terms of women, we are pretty worried about the future that this constitution presents. All right. Well, thank you very much all for coming. Thank you.